Shalom, family friends, wonderful to be with you. Today we are going to have a very exciting program. You know, we are speaking right now about redemption. And when you have redemption, there is the pangs of uh, the birth pangs. And so you have crisis, you have trauma, and you need to know how to behave with that. And today we have an amazing lady, Miriam Balin. Thank you, Miriam, for coming. Thank you for having me. This is great. Miriam is working with the EMS, it's like the medical uh, services United at Salah here in Israel, but she is also the founder and the, direct, the national director of the Psychotrauma Unit and also the Crisis uh, Response Unit, which is very important, is new, kind of new, few years. And she created that because she saw that when people were having accident or trauma, people were looked, they, they were a team coming for the body, but they could see people around who had crisis because they were seeing what was happening and nobody was looking after them and they had really trouble later on or even like straight away but also later on so she has created something amazing i call her an angel of life and also a revolutionary because because of her work so many things is happening in israel but also in the world miriam thank you for taking the time to be with us oh, it's an honor now, tell us a bit of what, because you started, um, first of all, you come from America, you make Aliyah here, your husband is a, is a doctor, you came to work with United Atsala. That's right. We've both, we've both always wanted to be involved in EMS. Mm -hmm. My husband has been involved in emergency medical services for many years now. Even throughout his medical school experience, he was working as a volunteer as an EMT saving lives. It was something that I very much wanted to be part of. I would see the fulfillment and the excitement that came along with it and helping save a life. Um, and when we, our dream came true of moving to Israel, we reached out to the organization, United Hatzalah, and we asked to be able to be volunteers. He was then a physician, so he became a volunteer physician uh, to be able to go to emergency calls in our area. And then I took the course to, be, to become an EMT as well, so that I could do the same. Uh, we replaced our romantic date nights at restaurants with um, going on emergency calls together at night, which is very romantic. <laughs> um, but that became our way of life, and it's an amazing way of life. It can be hard at times, but to know that your community has you there when they need you most is a really fulfilling feeling. So that's what we started doing. It was about a year into my work in EMS that this idea came up. It was almost like an epiphany uh, where I actually had my own personal experience where I was involved in an accident where a motorcycle hit me and I was knocked onto the ground and then an ambulance came and my own team member who usually I treat people together with came to treat me and it was very overwhelming. Um, but when I went to the hospital and they did all the checkups and they saw that I was fine and I came home, I decided to go back to where the accident took place so that I could say thank you to all the people that helped me because people came out with a blanket and tea and a telephone and did whatever they could. And when I came back, I saw something really horrific, and that was how traumatized the people were by just having witnessed my accident. And my accident was, in my mind, a seemingly insignificant trauma because I was fine and I was talking to them and I was okay. I didn't die, I wasn't badly injured. And to see, especially as a therapist, which is my profession, to see that immediate traumatic effect and so significantly in what was insignificant trauma just made me think all the more so about the really significant traumatic events that we see in Israel all the time, like terrorist attacks, sudden infant death syndrome, suicide, bad car accidents. Um, so I just, I felt at that moment that we have an amazing response in United Hatzalah of medical response. We have medics and paramedics and doctors that can in less than 90 seconds arrive on scene to save a life, but they don't know how to identify people that are suffering from trauma, emotional trauma, and they don't know how to deal with that if it does get noticed. So I realized that there are so many people, and I looked up the statistics, and for every one physically injured person, there's actually five traumatized people who go unnoticed. Or if they are noticed, the wrong thing is said and done. So I just said, why don't we have a team that knows what to do and what to say, how to say it, what will do harm, what won't do harm, so that that person can be stabilized and supported on scene, hopefully setting them up for success down the line. And when I approached the organization and I told them that I think this is something that's necessary, being a very innovative organization, they said, let's do it. And the question was just how, with whom, when. So we spent the next year working to be able to understand protocols already existing around the world, which there aren't any in dealing with that immediate trauma. There are 
protocols from the World Health Organization called psychological first aid that is usually done through other organizations like the American Red Cross, but in very large incidents and in the days to weeks after the incident. And we wanted to adapt that and tweak it and add to it so that it could be used in the moments of the traumatic incident, not in the days to weeks, but rather the minutes as it's unfolding. And because not, it, oh, it helps, isn't it, if it's like straight away? Sure. Mm -hmm. Sure, and we didn't just want it to be major incidents. We wanted it to even be in the most intimate incident, like a, you know, like I said, a suicide or a sudden infant death syndrome type of situation. Um, and that's exactly what we did. And we started with a pilot group in Jerusalem of social workers, psychologists, psychiatrists, who are all on call, just like our medics and paramedics are on call to go out for physical needs. They go out for the emotional needs. They don't get there in 90 seconds, but they get there in about nine minutes, which is also amazing to have a mental health pra practitioner on scene. And they are there to ground and stabilize that person to be able to be there for them in that time. So when did you start? I'm curious, how long has it been started? It's been three years now. Three years. Oh, so it's still very new. It is very new, but we did a, a lot of work in expanding quickly because the results were so great and people were so receptive to the care. And people were thanking us endlessly from our pilot group in Jerusalem. Um, and we saw the need around the country, so we expanded. We now have 500 participants in the program from the very north of Israel all the way down to a lot to the south of Israel. And they're on call to be able to do this work. And if they happen to be at the right place at the right time, they do it. And different communities? All different communities. Anybody and everybody who wants to participate in the program who has the right licensing is able to. Mm -hmm. So we have people from the Jewish community, the Christian community, the Arab community, the Druze community, Bedouin community. We have basically people from every walk of life. And of course, we're helping people from every walk of life. Exactly. So could you give us a bit of the steps when you see somebody who is traumatized, the sure. sign first of all, because sometimes even people, they don't know that they are traumatized. For sure. And it's after that they realize, oh, I was traumatized, but it's a bit too late. So people react to trauma very differently. Mm -hmm. And you and I can watch the same exact accident take place and you'll be traumatized and I'll be fine. Mm -hmm. So what is trauma? Trauma is somebody who feels that they don't have the wherewithal to deal with or process what's happening to them right now. So you would be traumatized because you don't feel like you have that ability. And I'm not traumatized because for whatever reason I have different strengths within me that do make me feel like I can handle it. So people react differently. And we have what we call uh, subjective units of distress scale from 0 to 10, which we use to assess people. And people can be everything from yelling and screaming and crying to totally dissociative and not speaking at all. Um, and that can actually be even more challenging. And that usually is actually showing us that they're in a higher level of agitation because of that. So people used to say that we're the hug team and that we come give hugs because they don't understand that what we do is actually uh, scientific and actually is a real true protocol. But we don't just give hugs. Hugs are nice. I give good hugs, but that's not our main work. Our main work really is a few things. What we're doing when we arrive to a scene is, number one, we're building a safe place for that person to feel what they're feeling. People in stressful situations and chaotic situations like to yell and scream and instruct, and they tell people, calm down, ma'am, nothing happened, ma'am. And that's really insensitive to tell somebody that's potentially going through the worst day of their life. Mm -hmm. So number one, to build a safe place for that person to feel what they're feeling. And number two, to advocate for that person. Because when somebody is so vulnerable and something so stressful is taking place, people want to make decisions on their behalf or uh, help them with a good heart. They're trying to help, but they do things that aren't necessarily what that person would want. So to be able to empower them to be able to make the necessary decisions or take the necessary steps. Um, we're also there to normalize. Normalization is a huge part of our work. To tell this person that their reaction, whatever it may be, is a normal reaction to a very abnormal situation, and that's okay. To give them permission to feel that is a huge thing because they think that there's something wrong with them. I'm going crazy. I have PTSD or whatever other pathologizing they're doing to themselves or others around them. Another big part of our work is psychoeducation, to be able to teach them about what's going on in their body, what they're feeling, and to explain that it's normal. The reason why you're shaking, the reason why you're breathing heavily, the reason why you feel stress in your chest is because it's a natural, normal physiological reaction to trauma that you've experienced. And then they can feel so much better in handling that because they know that it's normal. Uh, the psychoeducation and what may come down the line in the next few days, it would be normal to feel this and this because that will give them the ability to notice if they're getting better or worse. 
And of course, the next step is to provide them with the necessary materials, phone numbers, organizations that can help them later on, because we only work in the immediate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I was going, you, you don't see the people no, again after. No, we're there okay, in the immediate. You pass it to another that's team. That's right, and okay. that, that's where our last step of work comes in, and that is building a, a effective support system for these people. Mm -hmm. That could be family, that could be their rabbi, their imam, it could be transporting them to the hospital. It could be calling social services. But we build that support system so that when I walk out and I go back to my dinner or to my child's graduation or whatever I was in the middle of when I was called out, I can know that there's an effective support system in place that's willing to and has taken responsibility mm -hmm. for this person or family. Mm -hmm. Um, we don't deal with post-traumatic stress disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder is only diagnosable after one month after a traumatic incident. Okay. So because we're in the only, only in the initial stage of the trauma, we're in what's called acute stress reaction. And the first 72 hours are considered acute stress reaction. And basically within those 72 hours, all reactions are normal and acceptable. Mm -hmm. It's about preparing so the days. person. Mm -hmm. It's about preparing the person about what they're feeling now and what might come. And that's going to give them the ability to fall back into routine with as little psychological damage as possible. That's it. So because I heard that sometimes because of the work that you are doing, people will need medication because they know how to deal with the trauma that they had. So a lot of people that don't take care of the initial traumatic response and then later on do develop acute stress disorder or post-traumatic stress disorder, they do sometimes fall into the category of people that require medications to help them mm -hmm. or want medications to help them. And we very much believe that we have a lot of different resources within ourselves mm -hmm. and within our families and within our community. And we can teach and educate people to access those different resources. And then they can utilize those resources as opposed to falling immediately to either pharmaceutical drugs or even other things like street drugs, alcohol, different ways of coping with the trauma that they'll be feeling later on because it was not dealt with. Mm. Well, and also you went to Pittsburgh. We wanted to do a program with you and suddenly you had to fly over there. That's right. Can you tell us a bit again what you see? Because here in Israel, we can see the people are used to trauma. So they are building a certain resilience in them but like when, I know it, the same in France, when something happened, they are not used to that. So I guess in Pittsburgh, yeah. could you tell us a bit how yes. the community was? So th definitely the Israeli people have a certain level of preparedness and resilience just by the very fact that they're used to these things happening. Um, I'm not saying that that's a great way to live no. or that it's healthy, mm -hmm. but it is a fact. And that helps people cope when these things come up in a different way. Now and in I Pittsburgh, think they have, maybe they have even like, already a support done in, in Israel. I can see like the family will be important, like the synagogue will be important. There is already a tapestry Definitely. of, of there's, network. Definitely, there's a support system in place because mm. of that constant occurrence. Mm -hmm. In Pittsburgh and other places in the U.S. where things have happened, and never on the scale like what happened in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. uh, the people are not prepared for that, and they haven't experienced that, and they're not uh, prepared that that can happen so close to home. And when this, this took place, when I arrived there, I saw their traumatic reaction express that, that shock factor of not, have, not having ever thought that this could happen in my own backyard. Mm -hmm. And that definitely caused them to have a very significant traumatic reaction. And they were very, very affected by it. And in the days after the traumatic incident took place in Pittsburgh, you would walk down the street and you would see people who were still red in the eyes, still crying, still very vulnerable. Um, and that was largely because of that. There were other factors involved. Whenever somebody's safety is compromised, mm -hmm. this is definitely a result of, uh, of feeling like they're unsafe. A lot of our work was in dealing with uh, reinstituting the understanding that they are generally safe and that they are generally part of a safe community and a safe congregation mm -hmm. and a safe family and that this is the exception, not the rule. Mm -hmm. um, we did not decide to work with individuals because we couldn't therapize every individual in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. We decided rather to focus our unique skill set that we developed in Israel with the work we're doing on a regular basis. We decided to focus that on teams of community leaders and educators that would then be dealing with the masses. Mm -hmm. So instead of speaking to all the community members themselves. We spoke to the leaders of their community um, from the different educational institutions, universities, uh, Jewish community centers and whatnot. And we gave them a skill set that would help them in whatever they would see in the next little while after this 
incident mm. took place. So when we speak usually generally about uh, grown-ups, how is it for children? Is it a bit different for the children? Definitely it's different for children. We, the biggest mistake that we make is that we think that children are little adults. Mm -hmm. Children are different in and of, in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. um, children after an incident like this react in all different ways. Uh, they can have physical reactions like bedwetting and uh, you know headaches, or they can have emotional reactions where they're crying all the time, hypersensitive. And it's very important for parents to be and educators to be very in tune with the children and to notice those differences and to be able to give them an extreme feeling of safety. Despite what happened, they need to feel extra safe and things need to be extra consistent and routine needs to be very much in place. And we discussed with a lot of parents the importance of making their home as uh, regular as it could possibly be with having all the foods they like and the schedule they know so that the fam familiarity so would be able to comfort again. them. Mm. Um, because for them it's not as much people comforting them, that's important as well, but it's more their routine um, and, their, and the things that they know comforting them. So that is really important with children. Mm. Um, now, you, you are working here, but now I know that Neil Barkat was saying to you, uh, first of all, he gave you a award, which was wonderful to see. Can, can you tell us a bit of the story? Yeah, uh, about two years ago, I was awarded f from the mayor of Jerusalem near Barkat for uh, having basically taken this out idea that he called outstanding. Mm -hmm. And, and it is. made it a norm. <laughs> it I made it a norm together with United Hatala and our founder, Eli Beer, as a norm in EMS here in Israel so that anybody in Israel that experiences the worst day of their life or a very traumatic incident will have people that know how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And that is huge. That's huge, whether it's for the citizens or for the medics that are on scene, um, because we're investing. We're investing in the future of these people because it's a ripple effect, really. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what Nir Barkat was saying. I met him in another... Uh, in, in, uh, incident that took place where there was a fire, a building fire, where a lot of people's homes were damaged and a lot of people were evacuated and there was pure chaos going on outside. And when uh, the mayor came down to be able to pay his respects to all the different people that were displaced, he said that this is so important because there are not many people physically injured in a situation like mm -hmm. that, but so many people emotionally injured by losing their homes, their property, not knowing for those few hours where their family members were, and to have the right people that were a calm presence, mm -hmm. that were able to take control of that situation without judgment, and just be there to bear witness to that person's experience is huge. It's not about being a human doing, rather being a human being and mm -hmm. being with somebody. Oh, wonderful. This is beautiful. And now that this is like established in, in Israel, I was asking you, I know that, as you said, there will have also ripple effects, not just in Israel, but in other countries. Sure. And you tell us a bit what's happening. Sure. So we have a lot of different organizations that reach out to us and they want to learn the model. They want to incorporate the model. Obviously, every organization has its own bureaucratic setup in which we need to uh, find the right way to institute it. And they have a different setup also just legally. But we have had a few countries that have reached out. We've just finished training in South Africa, and they do have a fully integrated psychotrauma unit as well. Um, we've done a bit of training in the U.S., and we're hopefully going to be in South America soon. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a lot, of the, a lot of the organizations, when they hear about this type of work, it's just like, well, why didn't we have that up until now? Mm -hmm. It just makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. Now, I heard that you also uh, give birth to many help ladies to give birth. Yes. As a medic, that's my favorite yes. type of call. Yeah. That so helps me counteract the traumatic incidents that mm -hmm. I'm exposed to is by uh, not dealing with death, but rather life and mm -hmm. birth. And uh, I think that United Hatala has done a fabulous job of having women available for women mm -hmm. so that even though a birth can be traumatic in a certain way, mm -hmm. <laughs> though for good things, mm -hmm. to have another woman there that's able to not just do the right thing medically, but also give her that womanly touch of like care, concern, love through that experience does so much. And I've seen so many women who are caught by surprise when they have to deliver their baby at home. Mm -hmm. And to have a woman walk through the door and just be calm and collected and know what to do and give her a hug and a kiss afterwards makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is beautiful. Now, do you have some more dreams? Because this is like what you've done is already so amazing. Do you mm -hmm. have like another dream? <laughs> I have a lot of dreams. <laughs> um, I mean, at the moment, my dream is really that what we do will become standard practice in the whole world. 
And my dream is that in 10 years from now, every EMS organization in the world will have this incorporated and will feel shameful if they don't. Mm -hmm. Because it's something that doesn't just help the citizens of their own country or their city. It's something that helps their own medics, their own providers, because so many of our medics and paramedics are going out and being exposed to traumatic incidents. And having a psychotrauma unit, of course, helps citizens, but it also helps the organization. It helps their resilience, their ability to go save more lives. It reduces suicide rates of those providers. It's something that mm -hmm. can really change the face of the earth if we do it right. And I think that it's just a matter of awareness, a matter of understanding, a matter of seeing the worth in the work. And I think that that slowly but surely is happening. So I'm trying, and my mission right now is getting out to everywhere I possibly can to get more people to take on the, take the, take on the mission together with me. This is wonderful, this is great. Now, do you, I'm just thinking about firefighters. Do you do some Like, do you speak also to them? Do you do awareness also for them to have sure. a certain training? We speak with firefighters, we speak with policemen, we speak with the army, we speak with lots of different organizations that are also doing this type of life-saving work where they're put in a position where they sometimes need to help somebody. Uh, there's a protocol that was built in Israel by Dr. Moshe Farhi, which is psychological first aid that was born here in Israel that's based on the approach of activating somebody cognitively, mm -hmm. not just sitting there and being empathetic, but helping them do so that they can come out mm -hmm. of the trauma by doing. And that works very, very well in many of those settings within war, the army, the crime, uh, fire, to be able to have first responders or the people that are you know, out at the front of things who are exposed to something traumatic get back to their work or get out safely because we've not just been empathetic to what's going on for them, but we've rather, we've yes, activated them cognitively mm -hmm. to do the next thing that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And um, that works beautifully. We teach it to all of our psychotrauma responders as well as a tool to have, but it works particularly well with other EMS organizations. Mm. I'm just thinking, do you do things with schools also, like teenagers? Sure. And for them. Yeah. Sure. When I speak to schools, I have a little bit of a different message. Mm -hmm. And I always tell a story about Robin Williams, who everybody knew Robin Williams mm -hmm. and all his movies, and he was so funny and he was great. But he actually had a very dark side that a lot of people didn't know about until he committed suicide. And before he committed suicide, he said that, I used to think that the worst thing in life was being alone. And then I realized that the absolute worst thing in life is being surrounded by people that make you feel alone. And I think that a lot of the work that we do is amazing to be at a terror attack and be there for that person and to go out to an accident and be there for that person. But even just as citizens ourselves and not as psychotrauma responders, mm -hmm. we can be the people that give others the feeling that they're not alone. And no matter what they go through, even if it's not the worst trauma or the most catastrophic event in the world, but it's a less significant trauma, like losing a job or breaking up of a relationship or something like that, to be the people within the community. And I tell this to the students that they can be those people within the community that give that feeling to others that they're not alone and that there's somebody there that cares and will help them. This is wonderful. Oh, friends, I hope that you really enjoy that. Miriam, thank you for speaking about uh, this beautiful work. Thank you so much. And we you. hope that everything will go well and it will expand and that people from the world also will see I hope so too. Uh, this uh, beautiful work from Israel. And uh, you have a beautiful saying, which is like... He uh, who saves a life, yes, that's saves the entire world. Exactly, exactly. And this is wonderful. Friends, we'll see you next week. Bye. Shalom, friends. We carry on Geula, the redemption. But this time we are doing it a bit different. We are following the money. And you are going to see during the history the, where the Shekol has been. The Shekol is the name for the money in Israel now. But it happens a long time ago and it was in the Bible. It was used for weighing things and it was 180 grain of uh, barley. Okay, so it comes from the verb shakal and it was used as a currency. Then you have the first and the second temple and during the sec second temple you have the half shekel and people were giving it for the temple to, to be looked after. Then you had the revolt, the first and the second revolt. It was against the Roman Empire. So you have the Jerusalem revolt. So it was the Jerusalem Shekel. And then you had Bar Korba who came and it was the Bar Korba Shekel. And uh, you had like very beautiful coins. And then you had 
you know, after the people, the, the Jewish people were exiled, but there was still a shekel in Carthage. So it was the it was called the Punic shekel. Then you had Tyre, and Tyre it was um, it was a shekel, but this time because it was Tyre, you know, in north now is Lebanon, it was with a pagan uh, idol on it. Then there was nothing else. There was after the Ottoman Empire who came here in, in Israel. So it was, a la, uh, it was called the Ottoman Lira. And Lira comes from pounds. So it was the name in Hebrew, Lira. So it was the Ottoman Lira. Then you had uh, the British mandate who came. So it was called the Palestine Lira. Then Israel was made again as a, as a country. So they had the Israeli uh, lira. And then after when they were established, they said, we have to change this name and we need to have the shekel again. But like there were so many things that happening. It took 20 years for them to establish again the shekel. So it is called the old shekel. And then, so it was still uh, 1985. And in 1985, they changed again. Uh, because they, it, they had to change and put it on the new shekels because the old shekel was uh, like a lot of money anyway. It was like a lot of changes because the, the currency was, was uh, rising. And so it was called the new shekels. So now you can hear about the shkalim hachadashim, which means the new shekel. And you can see the sign and it's like sh for shekel and this sign for hadash. And uh, so Hadash means new and Shekol is the Shekol. So it's amazing. Now I want to show you something so cool. When you look at a 10 Shekol uh, that we're using every day here, on the other side is written Le Geulat Zion, which means to the redemption of Zion. And it's what we are speaking just on, about now. And uh, so now you know that, you know, is. Israel is being reestablished, Israel is standing strong and is changing and now this is a new shekel that we are using. This is what we learned today. I will see you next week. Bye. Miriam, thank you for coming and speaking about United at Salah. And like we are saying, you know, saving a life is like saving like an entire world. And be good to your neighbors. We will see you next week. Bye.